lot about math. And so I just applied that to being something that was exciting and fun, which the entertainment business definitely is. And so I loved that I've been on the TV side, I've been on the movie side, I've been on the now the business digital side for the last several years. And then when I was running Madonna's company at the time, I was COO, CFO of Mavra. And, you know, we made several movies and TV shows while I was there. And then I decided to pivot back into the business side of, of everything and not be on the creative. And then this is when Slate had come up and, and said, hey, we want you to be the CEO of this company. Company and you know we have all these algorithms and math that you know may help us make predictions and investment decisions about content. So I thought that was really unique and interesting, you know, on my career path. Welcome to the Jess Larson Show, where I interview innovators and leaders. Today on the show, I've got Tim Wesley. Tim, thanks for doing this. Hey, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to read a little bit of a write-up that our team put together on you, and then you can correct it. How's that? Sounds great. Okay. So Tim Wesley is the CEO of Slated with over 20 years of experience in diversified areas of corporate business development, finance, strategy, product, sales, partner all around the world, really. Developed and launched AMC Theater's new on-demand digital streaming service and previously developed Redbox On Demand. Tim began his career in finance and business development at units at Sony Pictures and Paramount Pictures. And I looked through your LinkedIn. There's a whole bunch more things that aren't on there. But what what are some of the other high points? We I think the the only one I'd really add in there, I mean, because there's been a lot of uh, during consulting times, but uh, was the COO, CFO of a company called Ripe Digital Entertainment. We raised a lot of private equity money for that company. And we were the first to do short form ad, ad supported video uh, on demand through the cable and, you know, on every Every mobile device that we could possibly find when there were mo really mobile devices that worked back then. And this is around 2005 to 2010. But we were the first to really innovate on demand, you know, watch anytime, anywhere. I think we actually coined that phrase and you could get it whenever you wanted to. And we were producing 350 episodes a month across three different on-demand networks. One was Ripe TV, another one was Octane TV, and then the last one was Flow TV. And that was a, a hip-hop on-demand network. And so those were highly successful. And, uh, you know, that was a great, great part of my career. That's awesome. So as I was saying before we started, I've actually been on Slated for a number of years, and I was really excited when when this worked out to have have you guys come on. But for people not familiar, can you, can you talk about $3 billion being introduced over a thousand movies and over half a billion dollars in box office and the Joker? And, and just some of the successes? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Slated in itself, it's the online, it's an online leading or leading online film packaging financing distribution company and marketplace. And so what we basically do is we give filmmakers the opportunities to get matched up with either financiers, distribu distribution companies, or even talent, you know, from producers to directors to writer writers to coalesce their project in the hopes that it gets released and produced. So we try to give them all the tools for them to be able to, you know, release these films. And so when we have all those numbers that come out, that's the amount of numbers of opportunities that we've given investors when you mentioned the billion dollar number. And then it's, you know, out of every film that's been listed on our on our platform. So if you looked at Peanut Butter Falcon is one of them. It was listed. It was there. We almost got all the financing together for it, but they got a better offer from somebody else. And so they moved on that way. But we still considered that part of our part of our ecosystem because it was there and we did a lot of work on that film. So it's, you know, putting all those pieces together and hopefully getting the filmmaker, you know, their film made for them is what we try to do. And we let our system do a lot of that, uh, you know, autonomously. And then we have a group of people, what we call our EP services team, where then we really try to guide the filmmaker through the process and handhold and make personal introductions to what's ever needed for that particular project. And can you actually talk about that for people not familiar with the film finance world or the film world in general, of like exactly what an executive producer team does? And like, what does it, what does it mean to package a film? So, I mean, at the 30,000 foot level, what it really means is every film needs a component of equity. Every film needs a component of debt and every film needs distribution to get it all, that all to coalesce together into a package that can ultimately be released. So if you think about it, you know, a film would tend to need 10 to 30% in pure equity money, the highest risk part. Then the debt comes in, which is provided by, you know, several different lenders and major banks, which, you know, fund contracts. So if a domestic distributor 
says, I want to buy your film for $7 million. When you deliver the film to me and it's completed for, they will lend, depending on the, the uh, wherewithal of that distributor, you know, up to a hundred percent of that money to the production. And then you have the soft money component, which are the tax credits from certain places that you can film in. George is very popular. Louisiana is very popular. Some other states and countries around the world to where you can take that basically guaranteed gover government money. And so banks will lend against that, against that as well. Well, and then that forms up the 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 financing plan of that project, but that all also hinges on whether you have a distribution plan and agreements with those companies. And so, you know, you have to have all three all three pieces that will finally get it into production and out to the audiences. So when you think about so like my understanding is your team has like seems like a, a almost like a film a month coming out for the next year. That's our plan. So we start now that, you know, we're, you know, kind of post pandemic and a lot of a production is happening. Yeah. You know, we've got a, a movie in production that we've been part of or partially financed or going through our distribution, you know, one a month in release and in production. So for people who look from the outside and this just seems incredible to find out you guys are doing things with, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, you know, Dustin Hoffman, Uma Thurman, you know, all these huge names, Ron Perlman, right? What, what kind of advice do you have for people who are fascinated by the entertainment space, but it just feels like an insider thing and they hear the, the horror stories of starting at the bottom and never getting anywhere? What kind of advice do you have for them to not just be a waiter and never actually make it into the industry? Join Slated would be yeah. number one because we can help you do what everything that needs to be done and we know the pitfalls, right? So, you know, you need some kind of, you know, consigliere person or company that helps you navigate these waters because it is a very tight, small town, closed system, and it's hard to break into. And we tried to provide the folks the knowledge and the expertise that we've, you know, built over the last 20 plus years as, as the team or as individuals that are at Slated to help them get there and, you know, not be trapped by the pitfalls that a lot of people find when they just go in with blinders on and don't have a company like us or people like us to help them navigate those waters. Yeah. Well, and I'm going to put a plug for your YouTube channel. So before your PR people had reached out about, or, you know, before we had gotten connected, I've been watching Slated YouTube re recently. And like, you just have, you have a lot of good stuff, like whether it's the, the short things about filmonomics where you guys are talking to different folks who have, have been able to package a deal recently, or just like the full webinars on how data analytics are changing the film industry, you know, out of like a personal interest level, because I've looked at starting a fund in the space multiple times. And just be because my other funds have raised money, my friends in this industry have, have, they come to me for advice on just general fundraising, you know, anyways. And I've sent a lot of people to you guys over the years of like, well, you should go look at these guys because it's not just the wait in line and hope you win the lottery. Like these, anyways, I feel like you guys have very practical advice. And, uh, and I feel like you're like a service to those folks who, who don't already have the connections in the space to the level it's probably needed. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good information there the, on that media that we've created. And then we also are now doing a weekly clubhouse, which then it gets turned into a podcast to where people, you know, we usually have somewhere between 75 and a hundred people that come in there on a weekly basis. <clears throat> they're, they're free there to answer questions from us, from my, my, the, my team. And there's usually five or seven of us that are out there doing it. So any any question, any, you know, any observation, any advice that we can provide, it, it's there at no cost for people to do on a weekly basis. That's great. You know, with the show, what we're kind of focusing on right now is talking to all these different kinds of experts and saying, you know, how did you reach success? What does it take? What does it take? to reach success in your area? And then what advice do you have for other people? Like, so our show is maybe aimed at, you know, some startup founder or a CEO who maybe people kind of roll their eyes at them when they say, hey, I want to build a billion dollar company. And it's like, yeah, don't we all? And people write them off as wishful thinking. And one of the reasons I, I love your space is, you know, Hollywood is full of people who beat the odds. You know, like talk about people who have been discounted and people whisper behind their back of they're just dreamers. You know what I mean? You know, like yeah. you guys and stand up comedians, you know, maybe like pro athletes trying to make it to the NBA are like constantly being discounted. You know what I mean? It's not like you tell somebody I'm going to go get an accounting degree. Everybody pat you on the shoulder. That's a, that's a solid thing. You'll be fine, son. Right? You you tell people like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to make it in Hollywood or I'm going to build a billion dollar company, and they're like, oh, that's cute. You know, call me when you grow up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. No. I have, Wait, why don't you weigh in on that to begin with? Yeah, but I have a little bit similar experience when I was at USD. I said, you know, what is the degree that nobody wants to go get? And it was finance because you have to do a lot of math, 
I said, well, you know, especially was focusing on business. So I said, I'm going to go do that. But then I pivoted and said, that's great. But where do I want to go do finance? I didn't want to go work at like an oil company or something like that. Right. Cause I was from LA. I had a lot of experience in the world of music before my brother ran a company that we did like a syndication business in the eighties where we'd meet every band and we would cut in 230 to 400 IDs. You know, this is Billy Idol and you're listening to WLFL in places where he wouldn't go, right? And so we would sit down with them for five or six hours and and do this with those artists. So I said, okay, that this is it. really interesting on the music side. I really want to be on the film and TV side. And I really just suicided a job at Paramount Pictures, you know, with something that was on the wall and on the comments thing. I took the little, you know, the little where they used to put paper and you you rip off the little tab with a phone number, call this number if you wanted to, I'm kind of dating myself here, but call the number if you want to, you know, have an interview. And so I did, and I got the job the next day. And that started the, you know, just, you know, wide eyed and, you know, 21 years old and sitting in an office in parallel pictures, I was like, wow, this is great. And so I just decided at that point, you know, finance is a skill and, you know, you have to understand a lot about math. And so I just applied that to being something that was exciting and fun, which the entertainment business definitely is. And so I loved that I've been on the TV side, I've been on the movie side, I've been on the now the business digital side for the last several years. And then when I was running Madonna's company at the time, I was COO, CFO of Mavra. And, you know, we made several movies and TV shows while I was there. And then I decided to pivot back into the business side of, of everything and not be on the creative. And then this is when Slate had come up and, and said, hey, we want you to be the CEO of this company. Company and you know we have all these algorithms and math that you know may help us make predictions and investment decisions about content. So I thought that was really unique and interesting, you know, on my career path, and decided to take the leap. Yeah, you know, I think there's a few messages in there. One of them that I like is you know this idea of, of finance, right? Like if somebody's going to build a billion dollar company, like no, knowing the numbers is pretty key, right? And yet, how many of us? shy away from the parts that aren't fun instead of embracing the parts that other people don't want to do to have that competitive edge, right? I will never trust a CEO that does not know how to build a financial model about their business. You just have to know that. You have to know the mechanics. You have to know the math. You know how to have to write if and statements in Excel, you know, all that fun stuff. Because if you don't, then you're not going to see what's what's around. You're not going to be able to see what's around the corner. And you have to be able to do that in this business because it, it flips on a dime and it's so quick. I mean, just look what happened with the pandemic, right? We were all, you know, going at you know, full speed. And then all of a sudden this big, huge curveball came in, which changed all the financial models and are still changing all the financial models today to try to make the predictions of making investments. And when you make those investments, you are using financial models to try to tell you whether it's, you know, a positive MPV and going to get you the IRR that you need for your way to cost of capital. If you don't know all those little things, you know, you should not be pulling dollars into the movie business or the television business or anywhere in the entertainment sector at all, you know, because then you just, you could get, as you've seen and you've heard, there are our horror stories out there where people get birthed and it's not it's not really that you know it's on the finance side entirely you, the, people sign contracts you know that are ironclad and they just don't really understand what they are saying and how that mathematics work when a lawyer writes it all down in several steps but how to put all those steps into a mathematical calculation that tells you if you're going to make money or not so it's highly important to have that education and that knowledge about the intricacies of finance inside of the entertainment business well and probably any business right like i'd love to talk about some of your previous experiences like I, i'm thinking right now i've got a couple of friends who who've been on the show who have been able to get get their business kind of the hundred million dollar level and and it's kind of been a plateau and they're they're really we have these conversations and they're really thinking about okay what's it going to take to get to the next level can you talk about your time at amc and and developing and launching the on-demand digital service and just like the challenges that people like that that we probably wouldn't expect those of us who weren't a part of that with you yeah i mean the challenges with that business you know number one is you know building those systems to be able to deliver those type of that type of content to the end user on multiple different devices right so it's highly technical it's highly complex it's not like putting a move you know a show on youtube and it just goes up and everybody can watch it it's there are restrictions and there are drm re requirements there are device 
interface requirements, user requirements that the studios who ultimately owe the content apply to any digital service that you're running. So to get this through the complexity of getting a movie to play on an iPhone or an iPad or an Android device or a Roku or an Amazon Fire, you know, there is a lot of work that goes into that. I mean, I think at the end, right now at AMC, they're probably working off of 25 to 35 variants of a piece of content, whether it's 4K, UHD, HD, SD, and the system has to decide on the fly, depending on bandwidth and what device you're on, which one to serve up to the consumer and then fly it on the change. If you're on the cellular, then all of a sudden you're at five bars, you're going to get the HD version. If you go to one bar, it's going to start sending you the SD version. So these things are highly complex to get done. And then you're asking a consumer to purchase something right then and there to use the money, which is the juxtaposition to the SBOD business where they you know it's just one time a month fee and you get access to all this content. We're asking them to say, you know, buy a movie ticket essentially at a lower price, but you get it on your home devices. So it's a, it's different and the same as the SBODs, but you know, it's highly complex and technical to get everything to play the way that you want to play it on the device that it's expected to play on. So I have so many questions about this. When you think about a task like that, how much, you know, being, being a finance guy, not a computer, not a computer programmer by training, how much of that do you decide to learn versus just trust the experts? Like when you're, when you're thinking about like, man, I need to know enough to make the decisions, but I don't need to know everything. How do you, how do you balance out how deep to go yourself? On, on understanding the technical aspects there? Well, if you looked at, so when I started at Ripe Digital, we built that whole system ourselves, right? And I okay. was people in that whole thing. So I had all that background and we didn't have all the DRM restrictions and the other things as movies do or TV shows do that come up from major studios or networks because we were making the content ourselves for that. So we didn't have to employ all that stuff, but a lot of the, you know, underpinnings of that were still the same. And so when I went to and did this at Redbox, well, first I did it at, at Dish Networks for Sling TV and what was that at, for Blockbuster at the same time. So we, you know, got more for, from that and then moving to Redbox. You know, I deployed a system of, you know, I wasn't the technical expert, but I knew enough to be dangerous. So I, we made the decision from a corporate point of view to let's lease the technology from the experts who know what they're doing. And then at some point there's an inflection, there's an inflection point on that curve that you say, it's not worth paying the vendors anymore. We should just build this ourselves and make the capital investment. If the business was doing on the trajectory that it was supposed to do, you know, from a revenue and cost standpoint. So we would do that. And then I deployed that same system at adding and see where I said, well, let's, let's lease it all out from the experts because that's the, the least path pathway to go or the least expensive pathway to go until we get to a place to where it makes sense to make the capital investment and build it and, and bring everything in house. And still today, EMC is running with vendors that are, are supplying them all the technology, you know, on the back end, you know, and it's a mixture of, you know, the AMC folks doing IT folks in part of them creating it. And it's partly the vendors that we use to create it because there's just a lot of steps in the process and they've been, the vendors have, you know, you know, economies of scale that really help out somebody who wants to get started on the digital side to enable them to do it. Yeah, that's a perfect example. So I'd love to kind of dig into that a little bit. When it comes down to that decision of like, okay, yes, now we think it finally does make sense to invest and, and kind of take the whole thing on ourselves. You know, tell me about the fears of like, are we too early or what's this going to cost? You're like, tell me about the go, no go decision there where you're like, you're getting to this point. You're like, man, is it time yet? I'm not sure. And yeah, well, well at some point you say, you know, with the revenue, because the, the on-demand business itself in transactional in the transactional world is a very, very low margin business. So you need to have huge volumes to make it make sense. And so with that, you know, you, you would look at the curve and say, you know, when my revenue gets to a certain point, I'm paying these vendors because most of them all have revenue share inside of those deals, plus license fees and et cetera, for licensing the technology. At some point when your revenue gets big enough, you, you're going to make that call to say, no, it's not worth me spending 15 to 20 million or $30 million a year. You know, based on the revenue to these vendors, I sh could build the entire thing myself for that amount of money. And, you know, now it's time to make the capital investment because my revenue run rate is at the right trajectory. Yeah. And I want it to be that it makes sense to make that investment. Yeah. Well, that, that leads to my next question of, you know, there is such a war for the top talent. Like you're like, okay, we're ready to make this decision. The numbers make sense. When you think about what's been successful for you in attracting the right types of folks to come build that in-house and to, to take on those technical challenges. What do you feel like has been effective at, at getting, you know, the quality of team that you need? 
I, I think it's like when you look at those two companies in particular, that they had, you know, large IT teams who, you know, are running websites, running mobile apps and doing everything. And this is just another add on for them. And they all have the expertise. You know, it's, it's another thing if you're going to say, I'm going to be a startup and go in the SBOD business or the TBOD business, you know, that's, that's a challenging part, right? It, but, you know, with these bigger companies that have the balance sheets to be able to build things like this or to have the teams to support something like this, that's, that makes it, you know, a lot easier because you're not asking them for a much farther leap from what they're already doing. If you look at those companies, they're playing trailers. They have, you know, video players on the different devices. Mm -hmm. They're three quarters of the way there already. And it's not, a, it's not that far of a stretch for them, but it is an investment, you know, to build up the infrastructure to do, you know, I mean, if you go down the stack of, you know, from the loyalty account to the, you know, account management of, you know, the, the license keys and the rights to give it to you on a certain device, to the payment processor, to the payment, you know, to keep it all together, you know, it's, it's easier when you have, you know, the infrastructure and an already large IT team in the space doing it that are on staff and are already there in the talent, you know, usually in my experience has been there that you didn't yeah. have dollar work well much. then let's switch over to slated so thinking about slated as you guys are growing and and you know probably don't have those size of teams to pull from and yet you need you know as you grow you've got these new things you need to get done you want somebody really great for it what what kind of tips do you have for for you know what's been effective at slated and, and how you think about bringing on the top people going forward well, right. It's a different economy now and people are expecting, you know, more dollars to get paid for the work that they're doing because they're, you know, especially on the IT side. And what we see is that, you know, it's the costs are just increasing and to attract that talent. So whether that cost is in hard capital that they want in salaries and bonuses of, you know, some type of guarantee or whether that's in the most, ex the most expensive form of capital, which is the equity of the company, right? And, and granting options. So it's how do you make it a fun environment? You know, we're fully, we're a fully virtual company. We don't have, you know, Slack is our main way of communicating between the two uh, and it's always on. And I can't even tell you how many times I get slacked in a day. It's, but it's, I don't feel like I'm missing anything by not being right next door to them, you know, in a different office. I mean, they're literally right there in front of my face, you know, all day long, which I love, but it is, it is difficult to find in a competitive market, you know, the right type of people. But when you, you dangle out there that this is the entertainment business, we're making movies, you know, you find a lot of tech folks that, you know, are also, you know, big on movies and, and the kind of movies that we're getting involved in is what they really, you know, tend to gravitate towards. So it's hard nonetheless, but still we think that with what are, we are competitive and what we pay people and with equity, but we think that we have, what we're doing is really unique and we find people that just are movie busts and they're also happen to be, you know, huge, you know, have a huge experience in IT. That's great. Well, I, I want to pick up on something you talked about there, this idea of not having an office. So we're in the same place right now. Like our team is here outside of Park City, Utah, Western Canada, Hawaii, Argentina, Colombia, and France right now. And there's some things that are great about it. And there's some things I don't love about it. So what what do you feel like helps you to have a high functioning, you know, a high performance team, even though you're diversified location? Well, uh, it's really about people have to be, people have to want to and be able to communicate, you know, virtually, right? So, you know, obviously the Zoom has, you know, kicked in and everyone's really used to what Zoom is at this point. I don't think if, if the pandemic never happened that we'd be doing as many video calls as we We'd be doing, we'd be getting a little more person. But we find it that it's really effective in a way that we can still stay close. You know, any question can come up at any time. And, you know, so it's no difference than somebody walking down the hallway and knocking on my door. They just slack me out and, or, you know, start a video huddle or a video call, you know. And I just think that, you know, for this team and how it's functioning, and they were virtual before I joined as CEO. So it was already ingrained in the culture that they were going to be virtual. I believe they got together once or twice a week, you know, at a common place, you know, just to have that FaceTime, which we still now that people are more relaxed I and mean, we at least get together two or three times a month, you know, whether that's just socially or we rent a conference room out at one of the, you know, sharing places like a WeWork or a Soho House Work or one of the others where you get in a conference room because you need a whiteboard session and you need that collaboration. 
which, you know, some of that time it's, when you're making real big decisions, it's harder when in virtual, you'd rather be in person. So we, we find that there's a nice balance and our employees and co-owners of the company, you know, love the way that we're setting it up as do I, it gives you the freedom to do what you need to do, get your work done. As I always say, my mantra is just get your done and it's fine. You know, that's, 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 that's what we do. That. And you do that, however we need to do that, we're going to do that. But there is a task at hand and we just need to get that task completed. Yeah. You know, we like to cut these episodes in half and we're about done with part one. Maybe a closing question. And and I can see myself having follow-up questions on part two. But, you know, there are a lot of folks that would like to be a CEO in the entertainment space, working on major movies with, you know, major Hollywood stars. And hardly anybody gets to do it. When you think about this level of success that you've achieved, what do you think you've done that not everybody else has done? I, I think it's to be, you know, you said it the other day on a phone call that I was on with, you know, there are, there were a lot of people in Hollywood that are, you know, unsavory types, I think is a, is a right term. I think that, and I was introduced as one of the good guys, right? I've always been true to myself. I've always been a fan of this business. I've always been a fan of everything that I try to do in this business and always take care of everybody that I've been around. And I think, you know, there's a certain group of us, because again, it is a small town that, that operate that way. And I think that's always the best way to operate, regardless of whatever your business you're in. But, you know, in Hollywood, you know, people come in and, you know, do some, you know, unscrupulous things. And it's unfortunate. And it's sometimes, as you mentioned earlier on the top of the, of the interview that, you know, that, that those are the stories that, you know, get, you know, get published more than the good guy stories. Cause everybody, you know, at the headline, it's all clickbait, right? Everybody wants the, you know, the bad headlines going to get more. So, you know, just stay true to, you know, my, my whole experience has always been stay true to yourself, be as honest as you possibly can and don't people, and you'll, you should be able to make it fine in this business. And you also have to be a relationship builder. I mean, this whole, Hollywood and the entertainment business in and of itself is all about relationships and treating people right. And so you do get those comments about, oh, well, Tim is one of the good guys. You can trust him. You know, that that's the best compliment I could ever have in my career about anybody that I do business with in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the Warren Buffett saying it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to lose it. I <laughs> think it's probably possibly true. <laughs> possibly true. Oh, this is great. Well, Tim, where are the best places for people to find out about you guys on Slated.com? Please go there. Or we're currently in a capital raise and we're we're trying a crowdfunding type of situation on Republic.com. So if you want the most up-to-date information about what I'm doing and where we're taking the company, you can go to a Republic.com forward slash Slated and you'll get all the information there about the raise and all the, you know, the all the details about where our vision is and where we're taking the company. That's great. Okay, everybody, tune in for part two. I got a whole bunch more questions for Tim. Thanks.